being here this morning, and thank you for your presence here. I am uh, appreciative of being back. Um, it was a, a weird experience not preaching. Um, my father-in-law is an excellent preacher, but uh, it felt weird not being in the pulpit, and it certainly feels much better being in the pulpit um, when you're used to it. Very peculiar. I'm sure many of you, uh, some of you probably understand that in relation to other things. Many of you don't ever look forward to being in the pulpit, and that's okay. I understand. Um, we are beginning a series on grace. Uh, we just finished a, a series on forgiveness, um, both how to forgive uh, yourself and those around you as well as God, and what forgiveness is. Grace is not the same thing as forgiveness. In fact, grace uh, is the uh, is the lead-in to forgiveness. It's where forgiveness comes from. But the idea of grace is a much confused topic in this world today. We deal with a lot of people who have very odd concepts of grace, uh, what it means, how it applies, and where it comes from. Um, to begin, though, the first concept that we need to establish is what grace is. The word grace, coming from the Greek, means unmerited favor. And it's usually associated with God, though it is not exclusively associated with God. Um, when anyone does something nice for someone else for absolutely no reason or less reason than they have good reason for, then that is unmerited favor. So if, uh, if you're in a restaurant, I will use this analogy a lot, so please keep it in mind. Uh, if you're in a restaurant and someone pays your bill for you, and unless you owed them money and they are, uh, unless they owed you money and this is the way they are uh, fulfilling the debt, uh, they are extending grace to you. They are unmerited favor. They are giving you something that you do not deserve and have not earned in response to some kindness that they are giving you. Um, this is the idea that David brings up in the Psalms. What is man that you are mindful of him? Lord, why do you care at all about humanity? Uh, what was just read a few moments ago by me, uh, Romans 5, that we are not worthy of the grace of God, that we are unprofitable servants, that we are ungodly, that we are sinners, that we are enemies of God, and yet it behooved God. It, God decided ahead of time even, knowing that these things would transpire, that he would be have a desire to forgive us, to help us through our difficulties and our iniquities, to bring us to fruition. <coughs> um, some of the issues on the ideas of grace stem from a misapplication of verses on grace. For instance, in John chapter 1, John chapter 1 and verse 17, he says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And some people conclude from that passage that there is no grace in the Old Testament. They will conclude this because it says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, which means that grace and truth could not have come because Moses is the one who gave the law, not Jesus. And the problem that we have is, is that they're trying to take one passage and extend it over, in a general sense, over everything. And what happens in the New Testament, is something we're going to deal with a fair amount of times, is that the word grace, just as the word truth, will be used not just in the generic sense, grace meaning unmerited favor, and truth meaning something that is absolutely, unequivocally true, but more precisely, that sometimes those words are used as fill-ins for other words. In this case, grace and truth are both in relation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll see that as, as well in Titus chapter 2, which we'll go back there in just a moment. But if there's no grace in the Old Testament, we have this difficulty because in, in Genesis chapter 6, in verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. The Old Testament sacrificial system was built on grace. The Israelites did not deserve an opportunity to be redeemed from their sins through the sacrifice of animals, which looked forward to Christ. There are many aspects of grace in the Old Testament, many opportunities that God has demonstrated to the people. Why did God make a, a covenant with Abraham to begin with, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They were not, uh, there was nothing that they could offer, nothing that they could give that would come equating to the idea of what God was going to give them and their families, and yet God gave that to them. God gave them his favor and his resolve. Grace absolutely is in the Old Testament. Truth is obviously in the Old Testament. All the things that the prophets, as well as Moses, as well as uh, uh, the histories that transpire there, are all true. <clears throat> and so it's not the case that he's talking in John chapter 1 and verse 17 that grace and truth are exclusive to Christ. 
But more precisely, that grace and truth are talking about something else entirely, the gospel. As we find in, in the early parts of John chapter 1, in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God at the beginning. And we have this idea of a word, of a series of letters, as we would conclude. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about a series of letters that communicate some thought. He's talking about the utterances of God. He's talking about the way God communicates. And that was through Jesus Christ. And so we find in these situations that the Old Testament certainly does contain grace. But in this case here, as well as in Titus chapter 2, we have the situation where, if we look at verse 11, he's using the word not to conclude just unmerited favor, not just God's unmerited favor even, but he's talking about something in particular. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He's talking about a particular grace. Not any old grace and not any particular grace other than the one he's talking about. He's talking about the gospel, that which brings Salvation to all men. It's important also if you back up. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you back up in verse 9, he says, Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And so he's talking about he's talking about slaves there. But then he concludes in verse 11, 4, right? He's making, a, he's making an argument from the previous verses. He's talking about slaves and how slaves have a place in the kingdom. And then in verse 11, notice what he says. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He's just talking about slaves. And now he's going to conclude that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Which would include those same slaves that he was talking about. People that the world would just conclude were unimportant, could be overlooked, that didn't matter. And yet to these individuals, God, he cares about them. He cares about them in a way that shows the most prominently that he certainly cares. Grace, this grace that we're talking about, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this unmerited favor that is not ours by right or deserved in any way, but is available to us. This grace is one that brings salvation, and yes, it is to all men, even bond service. Men and women, anyone who is capable of receiving it, it is available to them. It brings salvation. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, this grace, it saves. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes in the Jew first and also for the Greek. So he's going to make an even broader statement. It's not just for those in slavery, those who have been enslaved, and those who are not enslaved. But he would argue here in Romans 1 and Ephesians, Colossians, that it is for everyone. It was initially sure for the Jews that God had demonstrated not only to the Israelites through the Old Testament, but he had prepared them to be the first recipients. But it wasn't but six chapters before the Gentiles are also added to the church. Acts 2 to Acts 8. And this opportunity for Gentiles to become part of the church, to become part of something that they were excluded from for a very long time, a special relationship with God. And the Israelites had been removed from that special relationship until such a time as they had included themselves in the kingdom of God and His Son. And so it brings salvation. This grace is a specific grace, a particular grace. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ which brings salvation. In Romans chapter 3, notice in verse 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's a good testament of all of us. And that's oftentimes a passage that we point to to demonstrate that we are sinners, all of us. Not a one of us. Not a one of us here, present, or around the world today, or around the world ever, save one, has been sinless. Not one of us. Not one of us are righteous on our own. Not one of us can keep the law. Not perfectly. And though we might try, and though we might think that we are doing a good job, our failure is evident in our inability to keep it perfectly. Because we fail and we fall, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeems us from every lawless deed, Titus says. Or Paul says to Titus, I should say. Paul concludes to Titus that 
we are redeemed from those lawless deeds, that those sins that have beset us, and even the sins that we continue to be involved in, that they can be redeemed, that they can be cleansed. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, he says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sins. And some conclude that, that you have to remain in the light continually, that there is no stepping out of the light, or you remove any opportunity you have to receive that grace. But that doesn't even make sense in context with what he's saying. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, that means that you can never step out, that there is never opportunity and by that I mean there's, there's never opportunity to come back into that light. That once we step out, we are soiled and no longer uh, available to the kingdom. Then the promise that he makes makes no sense. If once we are saved and redeemed, then, then we have to remain perfect for the rest of our lives. We should try, certainly. But to say that we have to remain perfect for the rest of our lives concludes that there's no reason for the result of, of that commitment. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. What sins? What sins does it cleanse us from, or continue to cleanse us from, if, if we have to remain perfect? And so it's inconsistent to conclude that, that we're going to remain perfect for the rest of our lives, though that's an expectation a lot of us have. I have heard people who need to come to the gospel, who need to be baptized for the remission of their sins, and the reason they don't is because they can't, do it perfectly. And if you're going to wait until you can do Christianity perfectly, you're never going to be baptized. You're never going to come into Christ. You're never going to be His. And if it, you have to wait until you get your life right before you come back, you're never coming back. Because you're never going to get your life right in the way that you feel like it needs to be. And you're never going to be perfect. And that's not the point. The point is that we make the attempt, that we give our all to it, that we put our life and our trust and our hope in Christ and though we are going to fail, Paul even concludes that there in Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short. That is, continue to. We all still make mistakes. And Paul was not, was not alone in that. Paul was not perfect. And he concludes that numerous times through his teachings. Not just in the life before he became a Christian, but even during his life as a Christian. He does the things that he ought not do, and he doesn't do the things that he ought to do. And it drives him nuts. And that's good. It's good that it drove him nuts. It's good that it drives us nuts when we are not perfect, when we fail, when we fall. Because when it stops irritating us, when it stops bothering us, we got bigger problems than sin. Then we harden our hearts to the will of God. We need to be individuals who come to God and His grace and receive it freely, receive it openly, receive it every day. Because we need it every day. We need it all the time. Because that grace saves, and that's the only grace that will save. There is no purchase, no price that you can pay. There is no gift that you can give to earn or, or, or uh, make appropriate that, that gift. It is one that must be received in humility. It must be received knowing that we are sinners. But it must be received, and we must learn how to receive it. You know, receiving gifts is not an easy thing. Recognizing that we need something that we don't have and asking for it is not a simple thing. It is not an easy thing for our pride and our arrogance. But it is a necessary thing because this is not something that we can do on our own. But what the grace of God does, this particular grace, the grace of God altogether, the grace of God in this particular sense, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it empowers. Notice what he says there in Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, do you hear that? The grace of God, it teaches us. It teaches us various things, he says, in particular, denying the godliness of worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it also, notice he says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lost <coughs> deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. It teaches us how to change. Now, there is a, a desire in humanity to tell other people their problems. I will tell you that I have this, uh, this desire to give advice. But it's not the same desire that I have taking advice. That desire is much smaller. 
much more pressed down. But giving advice, I like doing that. I like telling people the things they ought to do, but taking advice, that's not my favorite thing to do. The grace of God it empowers us. It teaches us the things that need to change and how to change them. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 16, there are some there that Titus was dealing with in the island of Crete and the congregations he was dealing with. Remember, Titus, not just written to Paul, written, by, written to by Paul here, but also directed to go to Crete, the island in the Mediterranean, to teach and instruct and help. In Titus chapter 1, Paul tells Titus that there are some who profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. He even talks about the philosophers who say, their own people say that Cretans are these awful people. And I believe it because I witnessed what he said, as Paul says to Titus. So be wary of these situations. Be wary that there are going to be people there on Crete as well as everywhere that are not going to obey the gospel in truth. They're going to agree with it, sure, in principle. They're going to say yes, and they're going to say amen at the appropriate times in the sermons. But by their actions and their activities, they are going to deny God. They're going to deny the grace of God. They're going to deny Christ. And they're going to be involved in things that they ought not be involved in. And the grace of God teaches us that we ought to fix that. Not in other people, but in ourselves first. Jesus talks about the log in our eyes while we're trying to remove the mold from the small piece of speck in our brother's eye. How in the world are you going to take a speck out of someone else's eye when you've got a log in your own? And we laugh because it's so ridiculous, the idea. And that's the point. It's ridiculous for us to make judgments on others and to try to conclude the best course of action for another individual when we refuse to accept the course of action that God has laid out for us. We want to be wise in this world. We will listen to God, the creator of all things, the one who knows the beginning from the end. We will not listen to our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own <coughs> But rather, we will become the purified people, because grace purifies. That grace was intended to purify, to bring us forward in our relationship. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, Peter's talking to Christians, just as Paul is talking to Titus. Peter, there in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How did they become a holy priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation? How did they become that? Because they didn't do it on their own. It was not their own doing that brought them into this relationship, into this covenant. They were purified in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How? How did we become, if we have become, how did we become that chosen generation, that royal priest, that holy nation? Because Jesus has made us kings and priests according to his God. Because he has washed us in his own blood. Because he has allowed us opportunity to find that grace to help in times of need. And we need to take it. We need to take it. Because if we are not in that grace, then we are looking forward to something awful, something terrible. But in that grace, being in Christ, we look forward to something amazing. The perseverance of the saints in Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, is this. He says, Blessed are they who die in the Lord from now on, for they shall rest from their labors, and their work shall follow them. Well, that's what we want, but we don't want to give what is required. But this grace, notice here even in Titus chapter 2, this grace expects, this grace demands, this grace comes at a price. And no, it is not a worthwhile price in relation to what we get out of it. 
No, it is, it is nowhere near what we get out of it to what we give. Because we are ungodly. We are enemies. We are sinners before the grace of God has come upon us. So what are we giving? And what are we giving up? Our life in this world and the death that is awaiting us. We're giving up hell and receiving heaven. We're giving up the mess that is this world and we're taking a life that is in Christ. It takes a pretty, a pretty messed up perspective to not realize that we are getting everything and giving up practically nothing. You look at the mess of this world, you look at the people of this world and all the ridiculous things that they do or are involved in and they commit to, you can put that behind you. And yeah, you look ridiculous to them. Who cares? Who cares? But we get so focused on appeasing other people, of appearing like we know what we're doing. You know who I want to appease? You know who I want to please? The God of heaven and earth, the one who has purchased my soul with his blood. Because this grace expects. Notice he says, denying ungodliness. This is what it teaches. Grace teaches that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. You see, there's a couple of words there that are really important that we can't gloss over. It doesn't say that, it, that we can. It says that we should. We should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. There's an expectation there. That implies that God anticipates that we would do that, expects us to do that. Because this grace is not, is not free in the same sense that you can receive it, never have any expectation, never have anything to give. Just that what we give is nowhere near valuable compared to what we receive. Unmerited favor. Why did God do it? I have no idea. But he did it, and it's available to us if we are willing. We need to deny ungodliness. Luke chapter 9. This seems ridiculous to some people, that God would expect you to change. There are many people who believe that, that once you become a Christian, and some people don't even really understand how you become a Christian, but to those who become a Christian, they think that everything is, is fine now, that there's no corrections need to be made, that you can go on living your life however you see fit, that you can live in any iniquity, any idolatry, any, any form of ungodliness that suits your fancy. In Luke chapter 9, notice at verse 23, and he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Those are the words of Christ. Before the new covenant was even installed, Jesus is relating this to the people of that, of that time. Because these concepts, these principles that Jesus is relaying are not new to the New Testament. They were founded in the Old Testament. They were, should have been the understanding from the Old Testament that they did not come to. And you have all these issues, these situations that people have not yet come to a full and abiding understanding of spirituality. And yet these words that Jesus is giving them, that it's not just about the thing that you say. It's not just about baptism. It goes far beyond baptism. Baptism is simply the first step of obedience. It's not the last. It's the first step in life of righteousness. Not the last. It is the beginning, not the end. Because grace expects that we would deny ungodliness, that we would give up ourselves, that we would desire to lose our lives for his sake. And he's not talking about death in that case, though that may be an option. That may be something that comes our way. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, that we be faithful unto death. And for them, it could very well mean that their faith caused their death. Their faith, the people around them concluded that it would be better for them to be dead than to continue preaching the gospel. But they would not be alone in that. Many of the apostles, many of the servants of the king, Jesus. Many of the prophets died because they were faithful to him. But it doesn't just mean in death. You know, we say things like, well, I would die for you. Yeah, but will you live for him? Will you give every day to him? Or just in the off chance that someone demands that you die, or that you give up Christ, or you die, well, I would do that. Yeah. But live for him, I will do that. <coughs> Which is more difficult? Which is more telling 
no faith in Christ to live for him each day, which is what's expected, what's demanded, that we give ourselves fully to him. And if it comes to the point where we must give our lives for the cause, then so be it. But if it comes that I spend a life communicating God's will, of sharing the gospel with those around me, of being faithful to him, and the glory is mine, and the opportunity is mine. He also says that we need to be zealous for good works. We need to find ways of being active in the body of Christ. We don't need to wait. Zealous means that we are in the forefront. We are desiring, not that we have to be tapped for, to do anything. That again, the elders have to come up to us and go, hey, we really need X or Y. Hey, hey, <clears throat> I know that you really don't want to do anything, but hey, can you do this one thing for us this one time? It's like pulling teeth sometimes, folks. Getting people to be involved. But what are we involved in? I think that's where we're lacking is perspective. What are we involved in? Why do we care at all? So you could go out in the world, you could do a number of different things, and you can do important things. Things that are important to this world, right? As Solomon would say, under the sun. You can, uh, you can go out and feed the poor and you know, the hungry. You can build houses for the homeless. You can go into other countries even, and you can take care of them in exponentially large ways with the resources that we have available and the time and the treasures and the talents that we possess. But what is more important than a human soul? Nothing. There is nothing more important than a human soul. And we have the opportunity to affect the future, the eternity of people. So why do we struggle seeing the value? Why does the church, the congregation, not only here but everywhere, why does it so often struggle finding volunteers to do things? Why do we lack people? We should have folks coming and we should have to be like Moses and tell people, no, stop giving, go home. We've got enough. And it's just being problematic you're giving so much. It doesn't end with the pocketbook. It needs to press on into your life, into your commitment. Wouldn't it be great if we were all zealous for good works, if we found opportunities, if we said, yes, there is an opportunity, instead of, oh, no, there's an opportunity. Zealous for good works, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 7, he says, All servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, under the sun, right? Isn't it crazy? Paul's talking to these people about stuff that's under the sun. This is right living. With fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. I'll tell you that you guys, if some of us worked at our jobs as much as we worked in the church, we'd get fired. If this applied, if we just went and applied this, right, as to the Lord, then that's how we work. We'd get fired. We've got to resolve that the most important thing is Christ, and our life in Christ comes first. And then we can use this as an example of how we should work in our communities, in our jobs, work in the things that we that we enjoy doing, the humanitarian efforts. But so often, the congregation, the Lord ultimately gets gets the leftovers of whatever's left, whatever time we have remaining, and that's not okay. Because grace, grace expects, it saves, it empowers. And it expects. And this grace is available to those to those who are in Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, for many of you has been baptized into Christ, put on Christ. And you have that opportunity today. If you have not obeyed the gospel, then you believe, repent of your sins, you wish to confess Christ before many, you want to be baptized, you put into Christ. And you can do that today. And if you have walked away from him, now is the time to change, not... When you feel like you're more perfect than you are now. <clears throat> Not when you feel like you've come far enough. Now is the time to change. Now is the time to return that you can once again find favor in the eyes of the one who created the heavens and the earth. That you can avoid hell and you can enjoy one day heaven. 
And we can help you do that. We can help you get right with him. And if you're struggling with life and with the difficulties of life or perspective or with your spirituality, we pray that you would let us know that as well. We can help you in all kinds of ways, but only, only if we know that you're struggling, only if we know that there's an issue. Are we able to help? But we would love to. Whatever you need, we pray that you would come as together we stand and sing.